All right, welcome back everyone to CS126. This is week five of the class. So as I said last week, you want to be building or to be engaging in backups of your work, uh, not just open your file and work on it because if things go wrong, you don't have a backup. So I'm gonna take a moment to do a backup first. And one way to do this is well, on Canvas, under this week's resources, I have last week's work where I last ended up with. So imagine I've got that as last week's work. I'm not just going to start to work on that file. I'm going to make a copy of it and work on the copy. That's a simple way to make a backup. In my case, I'm going to also organize myself. I've got a USB drive that I bring back and forth to class and I'm just going to make a folder for myself, however you want to do this yourself. But for myself, I'm going to make a folder on my flash drive on your desktop, however you do things. And so I've got a folder. And then the file from week five, I'm going to download and open that 626 file in um, Animate, of course. And then I'm going to do a save as so that I can... Uh, work on a copy. And that's the basic way to do it. Before you start to work on anything, save as, give it a new name, like the date or version three, version 12, whatever. And then from there, work on the copy. So however you have yourself set up, I'm opening up 626. Save as with today's date on my new folder. I need to go back into the air settings when you do save as and save it into different folders. You may need to double check your Android settings. Let's see here, uh, no, on all of mine, my settings are still there for my Android settings and therefore the I can proceed from there. Um, if you, you need to open the file from Canvas. Uh, Angie, can you come and help over here and catch up Gil? So you'll get some help in a moment, but you need to keep up. So the, um, project at the moment, what I've got is a little bit of navigation going on. I want to add new navigation, of course new screens, new cool stuff. And we're gonna add the ability to um, pick up items for an inventory system. That's one of the things for today, as well as other things we're gonna do. Well, this week, we're gonna do a little bit of an inventory item thing. We're gonna do a mini boss sort of thing, branching paths, uh, random, random things happening on screen, and therefore uh, a lot of cool stuff little by little that we're adding. So just going through my game for the moment, we got up to the point about getting in the house. In my case, we're right here, which is nothing. Here, it's gonna be a hallway to go left or to go right. And from in here, we're going to add an element of um, uh, inventory items. We're gonna find a secret key found behind a painting. So we've got plenty of things to do today. All right, so first of all, what I need to do in my scene hall main, well, I need to draw a hallway here. And very simply, the way I will do this is, let's see, um, there's a wall right here, hallway that way, hallway that way. Very, very, very simple. I'll put a cool rug right here as well. Let's see the rug. There's a rug there, sure. Now the interactive elements. To go left, to go right, and there's gonna be a painting on this wall. Um, you're gonna move the painting and behind the painting will be a key. Well, that key will be used elsewhere. We're gonna have later on in the house, a door. A door that you cannot open unless you have the key. Okay, that makes sense. You've seen that in a variety of games. 
Um, I'm going to make it that the key, however, is like a side quest. It's not going to be a requirement for the game to fully work. The, um, the key will be optional. It'll be, it'll be an Easter egg. So consider that when you make your games, what are the required things? What are the optional things? And I'm going to make this key as an optional thing. So last week, we should have our interactive elements on their own layer, non-interactive on their own layer. Also, just for myself, I'm going to go back to where I had the notes in the code. This is optional, but I just want to add right here, to do requested feature, okay, character select, inventory. Um, I plan on doing inventory today. Uh, mini boss will be today. Cut scenes, character select, that's coming. Movement, that's coming later. And of course, if any of you have ideas as well, put them in the chat. But these are the ideas that we'll probably be able to get to at some point. Um, sort of icing on the cake. Although we'll be able, we will do the boss thing today or this week and the inventory this week. But in the hallway scene, right, so we're just, we're just gonna draw a hallway and there's gonna be the click to the left, click to the right, click in the center. Um, on its own layer of interactivity, I'm gonna draw a painting on the wall right here. on the C drive, top level C drive. All right, so the uh, painting right here will be an interactive element as well as clicking to go to the right. Now, I noted last week, things that are fully visible can be clicked on and interacted. Things that are invisible can be interacted with. So this whole area here, or whatever you want to define will be interactive. And I'm gonna fill it in in a very obvious color and then we'll turn it transparent. Uh, but anywhere that you click within the right hallway right here will be interactive. And then anyway, on the left hallway will be interactive. We'll fade it out in a moment, but we wanna see what we're gonna click on. Interactive as well. I'm just gonna fill it in with colors just so that it's very obvious. Now, right here, if someone were to tap, wherever there's color, of course, it'll be interactive. Wherever there's not color, it won't be interactive. So if someone clicks with the hand right here, well, that's transparent, there's nothing there. If they click on the painting, okay, that's wow. interactive. If they click on the um, nail right here, that's interactive, but that's not interactive where my string is at. That's just something to note. You could make it just in case someone accidentally clicks wrong. You can make that also filled in. You can make it transparent. But I'm just saying wherever there is any drawing, any color, any lines, those things are uh, those things are interactive. Obviously, later if we wanted to make the rug interactive, I pull the rug and find another passageway. But we'll we might do that later. So three things that will be interactive. Those three things then need to be symbols. So I'm gonna turn the two hallways into symbols. I'm gonna turn the painting into symbol. Starting with the left, with the left hallway, F8 on that, or right click, insert, or convert to symbol. And what do we wanna call this? Um, sprite, all left. Let's see, movie clip, center it, sprite all left. So now that will be clickable. Needs an instance name. So let's see, instance name. Um, Uh, 
the instance name, I will just call that uh, left hallway. That right, for that right hit spot, convert that to a symbol. SP for sprite, hallway right. Got a symbol on the left to click on with the instance name, left hallway. We've got a uh, symbol on the right with an instance name, right hallway. Symbol on the left, symbol on the right. And then the painting in the middle. After you draw that, select that to then symbolize it, F8. SP Sprite Hallway Painting. So notice I'm doing the SP at the beginning that it's a sprite. It's an interactive thing. I'm doing then the prefix hallway. This is happening in my hallway scene. Hallway left, hallway right, hallway painting. And then at the end, it's got the main name of the thing. And they're all movie clips. They're all centered there all symbols and then instance name don't forget that and I will just call that hallway painting all of these are on their own layer the non-interactive hallway is on its own layer the interactive elements are on their own layer eat out the hallway so that it's not a big red square later we can do that easily under the color effects. And then the painting itself will also be uh, interactive. Now with the painting, it's going to be uh, similar to other interactive elements, of course, that it's got an event listener. You tap it, something happens. The way it's going to be slightly different is after three interactions, then something will happen. The doorway on the very first scene, right on the front door, you tap it one time, it opens up, it interacts. The interactive elements over here, the door on the, on the front of the house, you tap it and it interacts every time, forever. The tree interacts one time, it breaks, it stops being interactive. The painting, here's a new thing, it's going to be interactive. It's going to sway a moment. Someone taps it, it sways for a moment. Okay. And some players will say, okay, it, it sways, and I guess that's it. Other players will say, can I sway it like five times and maybe knock it over? And some players that, that are a little more creative, they might try to interact with it more. And then after, let's say, three times, it falls over. So interactivity based on the number of interactions, then it's going to fall down and behind it will be a key. All right, so we'll we'll put the we'll make the key in a moment. And this painting will be a key in a moment. Um, in our code, we need to set up our code for the interactivity. It'll be very similar as before. An event listener attached to its instance name with a function that runs when the um, when we interact. Then there will be a timeline of the painting where there'll be a little animation of it swaying and it'll tap two or three times, it'll sway two or three times, and then on the third time, it'll fall. And then of course, when it falls, it's no longer interactive, so we'll remove the event listener. And because now it fell and it got out of the way, it's going to um, it's going to reveal a key behind the painting, which we will add to our inventory. All right, so in the code, I'm going to need the usual little bit of code. So I've got my example back on the title, where I can copy and paste the usual instance, event listener, and function. I need something very similar.
that back from before. Same thing as always, some instance name. You mute your device, please. That's the uh, instance name and the function name, which we define right there. We do that over and over. My instance name of the painting. Right there. Hallway painting will be listenable. And once I tap it, I'm going to run some function. Let's call this FN painting animation. Well, this code here, I'll break it apart for readability. I'll do my trace. At the very least here, I can save this and, and debug it just to check if my uh, if my code works so far. Obviously, the things that could go wrong here are I drew the painting, but I didn't turn it to a symbol. Okay. Another thing that could go wrong is I drew the painting, I turned it to a symbol, but I didn't add an instance name. Another thing that could go wrong is I didn't write my code here exactly the same instance name as it is on screen. Another thing that could go wrong is I, I named this function here not the same as this function here. If all of those four things work perfectly, then at the very least, this code should work perfectly. And again, this reminds us computers are dumb. We have to write it exactly perfectly. If I wrote a capital H there versus the lowercase, that's wrong. If I put a comma instead of a period, that's wrong. So all of these examples of things that are that could go wrong if you're not exactly perfect because the computer is not perfect. So let's see here. I'm going to do a quick debug just to make sure my code works. Then I'll get back to it. Debug. At the very least, at this point, I should see down on the console, down on the down on the responses down there. If I tap on the painting, I am getting down there that it does say painting. So all of that we've done over and over, that we'll do over and over several times. What we've done previously also, like with the doorway, we tapped on the door, the door animated open. We tapped on the um, tree and it animated falling. Well, we're going to do something very similar to the painting swaying. So the painting instance name, play. just like before. And you're gonna see, we're gonna use the same kind of code over and over. We might change a little thing here or there and then add new things. That's something we've seen before. Okay, that assumes now I had some animation in the painting. And then what we need to do also is to um, add the code so that after you pull the painting three times, five times, whatever times, then something new happens. Previously, when we interacted with an element that had animation, it animated one time, it did its thing. This time we have to keep track now. Did you tug on the painting three times? If you did, do something else. If you've only tugged it one time, do something else. If you tugged it on it 10 times, do something else. We'll make a note here. Um, animation and code in the symbol of hallway painting. This is just a little note to remind myself. As we work on a complex project, sometimes the code will be in the place that you need it, and sometimes the code will be in a slightly different place. So why not give yourself a note to help yourself with that? So now I need to add some animation and such to the painting. I'll switch over to the symbol of the painting.
by the symbol of the painting. I need a layer for my code. Symbol of the painting, I've got a stop. So in the timeline of the painting, a stop command, and then I will animate swaying. Um, this will be, let's see, I'll skip two frames, F6 to duplicate it. I will use the rotate tool over here to rotate it. But obviously I want it to rotate from the, from the nail in my case. If I try to rotate it, it's gonna rotate from the center. Well, I want it to rotate from the nail. This center point here is what determines where it rotates from. That center point there, it rotates from the center. If I put that center point where the nail is at, and then I rotate, rotates from the nail. So if you ever wondered, what's that symbol right there in the middle of my symbol? It is the rotation point. And so where the rotation point is, it's where it rotates from. Move it using the free transform to the nail, assuming you drew a painting like mine, you know, you'll fill in the details yourself. Make it rotate over a little bit, jump over F6, a couple more frames, put the rotation point back there, rotate it again, jump over to frames F6, rotation point opposite way, F6, two frames over, rotate a little bit more. And two more frames, F6, maybe bring it back close to where it started. So there's an animation there that obviously does not play because I've got a stop command like before. But then when you tap it, it's gonna play, it's gonna animate. And you tap it, it's gonna animate. It's gonna loop. As it plays the timeline, it goes back to the beginning. That's nothing new. We did that with the tree. We did that with the front gate. We did that with the front door of the house. Now we're doing it with the painting. The difference here now is that now we need to keep track of how many times a person interacted with the painting. We started to learn a little bit about that when we set up the boundaries to move the rock. Remind you on that, in order to move the rock around, on the front door, we created a, where is it? Uh, we created a, oh, rock boundaries rectangle. We created a shape where we could move the rock around. And I said that was created inside of a variable. A variable is a container a memory location to store information, to keep track of things. This is how computers can remember. This is how our apps can remember with variables, with containers. So we need a variable to contain. How many times have we pulled on the painting? So inside of the uh, timeline, Inside of the timeline of the inside of the timeline of the painting, we're gonna keep track every time it animates. Might even be able to do it just within here. Hmm. Because we did it inside of the timeline of the symbol. I'm gonna change my mind this time and see how it goes. And we're gonna do it outside the painting. Let's see how this goes actually. If it doesn't work, we'll do it the other way. This is the thing about programming. You ask 10 programmers how to do something, you will get 11 answers and they're all right. 
and they're all wrong. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish, what makes the most sense, what is the most elegant. You know, as long as the end result works and you've got 20 lines of code, that's great. As long as the end result works and you've got three lines of code, that's great. The advanced programmers can do something in three lines. The less advanced can do it in 20 lines, but both are correct. So I'm going off script right here. I'm going off the top of my, my head here. We're going to change it slightly compared to previous semesters, and we'll see if this is a success or not. Um, but what we're going to do here... This way. So I'm going to back up outside of everything. Create a variable here called uh, painting move times. How many times did this painting move? Colon capital number equal to zero. So the painting has moved zero times. We're going to tap the painting one time. That zero will become a one. The painting has moved once. We're going to tap it again. The painting number will become two. We're going to tap it again. It'll become three. Once it becomes three, do something else. And actually, we do need to do it inside of the. We do need to do it inside of the the timeline of the painting because then the painting will animate to fall down. So. Okay, never mind. We won't do it here. We'll do it in the symbol of the painting. Uh, we might be able to do it here, but it might be more complex. So uh, what I was about to type here, uh, I'm going to cut it and uh, paste it instead inside of the timeline of the um, painting. It's, I'm going to go inside the painting, and I'm going to paste it inside of the first frame of the uh, painting right here instead. So... This is where I want to do this, actually. Note here, keep track of how many uh, animations of the painting. When we reach three, then make it fall down to reveal the key. So we're going to keep track of something. We can keep track of many things, numbers names. That might be a to-do item, actually. That's one of the ones I was trying to think of. Let me add this to our to-do. I want to add the ability to, for the person to add their name so that the game says, welcome, Johnny. Let's say user name input. So again, just for my notes, don't worry about this. But uh, we want the person to type their name so that their name is in the game. Do that later in the to-do list here. All right, so I'm going to keep track of how many times it's moved. A variable keeps track of numbers or letters, um, lots of things. The, the way we add one number, there's many ways, of course, don't type this, but what we will do is going to do, then we'll do it. Don't do this yet. We have this command here, plus plus, which will add one. After the painting moves one time, then we will make it add one. And then what will happen is that painting will equal a one. When we tap it again, plus plus, will make it equal to two. When we tap it again, plus plus will make it a three. And then we will say, if it's a three, do something. That's the logic, the coding of it. It's that I want that plus plus to happen when it starts to animate and it starts to animate on frame two. So on frame two of the code, let's add a new blank keyframe. 
frame two inside the painting in the code layer. That's when I'm going to add That's when we're going to add the plus plus. And for the note, add one to our counter. I'm going to do a trace here to say the count is. Then I'm going to add the trace. The count now is. This is to show the flow of the code. The order of the code usually matters. We haven't had to pay attention to that very much previously. But for some other things like this, the order of the code matters. And so what I'm telling it here is when we tap the painting, this code will start to run on frame two. It will trace the message. The count is zero because this variable name is a container. Inside the container is a number. So by saying the name of the variable like that, we're saying, tell me what number is in that variable. Tell me what number is in that container. Tell me what number is in that memory location. Right after that, we're going to say add one to the count. Then I say after that, tell me what the number is. So logically, the very first time it should say zero, and then I tap it once, and then it'll say one, and then I tap it again, and then it'll say one, and then two, and then I tap it again, and it'll say two, and then three. Now, this is, of course, more effort than you would really do in a real app. But as beginners, 99% of you are beginners, I think it's good to be very obvious and explaining the code and showing possibilities and such, the logic of it. Because computers are good and cool and all of that. And like I said, they're dumb. Because if you don't program them perfectly, it doesn't work. And sometimes the problem is not that you typed the code wrong. It's that it's not a syntax error. It's a logic error. You typed all the code perfectly, but logically you put the code in the wrong order. The code command is not wrong. Maybe the order is wrong. The logic of things is wrong. And a logical error is not just that the code is in the wrong order, but that the code is not in the right place or that the code is not connected to the right thing. You know, there's many possibilities of logical errors. So let me run my code. Let me debug my code for a moment just to see if this is doing what I want it to. So I will get into hallway. Keep an eye out on the corner down there. Okay, I'm in the main hallway. I'm going to tap the painting one time. The count is zero. The count is one. Tap it again. Count to zero, the count is one. Oops, that should not re be resetting. Actually, it should be incrementing. Oh, I know why. I know why. So again, computers are dumb. So every time I tap, it's just going to say zero and one. That doesn't make sense. I, want, I should be adding one, adding one, adding one. Here's what's happening. The um, end of the animation, you get to the end of the animation, it automatically loops to the beginning. Wherever the playhead goes to, it will run the code. So when the playhead automatically goes to frame one, it runs this code. It stops the animation and it resets the number to zero. And then when I press play, it's going to go to the next frame again, which it's going to add one, zero plus one. It's going to go to the end. It's going to loop back to the beginning where it's going to reset it back to zero. Well, I want, to, I want to avoid that part. I want to avoid the part where it resets back to zero. So how about when I get to the end of the animation, I don't let it go back to one. I let it go to two. The default is that it's going to get to the end and loop back to one and reset back to one. It, it's going to do what, it, what I told it here create a variable called this and set it to, to zero. And therefore, even though I just added one right there, 
when I get to the end, it loops back to the beginning and it sets it to zero. So instead, when it gets to the end, I'm gonna have a go to and stop frame two. Frame two is where we're doing the addition part of things. So at the end of the final frame there, uh, insert blank keyframe F7. We're gonna have a go to and stop frame two. That way we're gonna skip the loop back to frame one, which is the default. We're gonna loop it back to frame two. Therefore we don't reset the, um, the counter. This is why I myself also stop and test my code every once in a while, even though I've got it all right here. Sometimes it does pay to just stop and test your code at that point, because then you know the logic things creep in. So here we can control a timeline, which normally goes from frame one to 12 and then loops back to one by default. I'm saying instead, when you get to the end of the animation loop back to two and stop there, and I could add the stop here, I guess, but we have the go to and play, go to and stop, and I jump back to two. Did not reset the counter now. Burn. Painting, tap on the painting, zero goes to one, tap it again. There we go. So it is adding the numbers properly. They're incrementing. So you see that was a logic error and not a syntax error that all the code is correct, but the logic of it is that the default goes to the final frame and loops back to frame one, which then resets the counter because frame one says, we set the counter to zero. We need to start at zero before we start adding numbers. Check the number at the start or check the counter. Add one to the counter. Now check the counter again just to fill out the comments. I'll add a comment here saying it's a multi-line uh, so that we get the counter by jumping back to frame one. We'll instead jump to frame two to keep on keeping track of the counter. We've got a little loop happening. Now, this is also working in my case because I also did my animation like this in twos. Remember when we learned about the animation, if you have two frames uh, of a particular pose of your animation, it holds for two frames. If you did it that you've only got uh, one frame at a time, it's gonna uh, it's gonna appear slightly different because then the loop is gonna stop at a point where the where the animation's moving. Because I put two frames at a time on each pose, I've got a pose here that is two frames of the stopped, and then two frames of every movement two frames of every movement. And then when go to and stop frame two, it is stopped on a frame of animation where it is not moving. If yours loops, loop, loops back and it's tilted, you might add one more frame, F5, insert frame. So these are these nuances that logically I know what I want, but then to tell the computer what you want, that's where the complication comes in. So I should be getting an animation happening every time I tap. Now we've got a counter keeping track of something. Once I've hit a certain number of the timer, I will have something else happen. And that something else is gonna happen after all of this. 
is back on frame two of the painting. Check how many um, how many um, interactions, how many pulls, how many how many sways. Or limit. Do something else. That's coming from a conditional statement. We've seen this before, I believe, if else. Did we already do an if else? I think we did. This is something then, or else do that. Did we do that? I think we want to remember if we did an if else before. I think we did. Um, one more I thought we did. Or maybe it's for the other class that I taught. So this is the AI things, making a decision if we reached the limit of the timer that I want, do something or else do something else. This is the basic syntax of that code. If something is true, do the following or else it's false, so do the following. a conditional statement. Known as an if else statement. And it's one way to make decisions. We've got like three or four other ways to make decisions. Maybe, maybe based on three things, make a decision. This is just based on one thing, make a decision. We can have based on 30 things, do a decision. For readability, I will break it apart right here. We've got the opening and closed curly braces. I will break that to the next line. Let's else break that to the next line. It's a good idea, again, as usual, to make some trace statements, trace commands, so that you check the logic of things. We can say, uh, true, we reached the limit versus false. We haven't reached the limit. I also like at the end of the, wherever there's a curly brace to make yourself a little note to remind you that this is the end of a particular block of code. You'll lose track easily if you don't. And if else, checker for counter. Right, so the logic that we need to check here. So if we had, for example, we kind of put a question here. So if we, if we say, uh, is 99 greater than one? All right, that's true, the number 99. There's no arguing about that. The number 99 is greater than, is more than one. So then this will trigger the true section. All right, what if we had, is 99 greater than 99, 99, 98? That's false. 99 is not more than 9,999. So that'll trigger the false section. It'll skip the true and instead do all the parts in else, the false. If we had this number, is that greater than this number? True. It'll do this part and skip the else part. So we can do things with numbers. And less than 99, okay, so that's also true or false, that's easy. Let me, here's a trick question, is seven greater than seven? Oh, seven is not greater than seven, seven is seven. So this will trigger a false, a flace, I mean, I mean a false. Um, seven is not greater than seven. Seven is exactly seven. Therefore, that's false. Seven is not greater than seven, false. 
Um, okay, if I want equality then, we do double equals. Regular old math, yes, we would see that, you know, one is greater than two is a thing, and uh, two is less than nine is a thing. But if we wanted to check, is one the same as one? We don't do it with a single equals. That's wrong. We do it with a double equals. Single equals is something different than a double equals. We saw a single equal a couple of times when we created a variable. And then we said, this variable is full of this number. What's in this memory location is equal to, is set to, is filled with zero. So this is an assignment operator. It's, we're putting it into it. it uh, this would be, take the thing on the right, put it into the thing on the left. That's not what I want. I want to compare. Let's compare one versus two. Let's compare two versus nine. Let's compare one versus one. Not assignment, not setting it to, but comparing. Double equals means compare. It will assign, correct. It will compare. So now if our question is, is seven the same as is seven equal to seven? Is seven the same as seven? True. We've got also, is seven greater than or equal to seven? That's correct. That will check. It's the same or equal to, and the weird thing is it's not a double equals there. So that's weird. Sorry about that. When they invented it, they didn't have that great idea. They should have. But that means greater than or equal to. Seven less than or equal to. Seven. This becomes a true. This one is a true. This one is a true. Six less than or equal to seven. That's a true. You see, even with true and false, we can have all of these variety of um, questions and checkers and AI. What we care about here is, have we reached a certain limit? The variable paint painting move times is keeping track of the number. So that is full of a number. In the beginning, when we've never interacted, it's zero. We then just need to pick whatever number we want. When the person taps the thing five times, we have reached the limit, do something. If we've only tapped it one time, that'll be less than five. We haven't reached the limit. When this becomes five, that is not greater than five, that'll be a false. When we get to six, that'll be greater than five, we'll reach true. This is up to you if you want to do greater than or equal to, both will give you the same result. You just have to pick the right number. For the moment, I'll just do a very simple greater than. For the moment, I just want to check in my console. I keep calling it console, the output panel. I want to just check in the output panel that this is working so far. My logic, save it. Debug. Let's see. So I'll keep track down there. You're at the hallway. Tap it. Got a the number one, two. Uh, false. We haven't reached the limit yet. Okay, cool. Tap it. We haven't reached the limit yet. No limit. No limit. No limit. True. We reached the limit. Eventually, I tapped it enough times that I've at least triggered that it detected that I've tapped it enough times, that I've interacted with it enough times. There's our logic, there's our AI working. 
That might be too many. I'm just doing it very obviously here. You probably want some reasonable amount of number here, like maybe three or something. And therefore, again, this is some people will tap the painting. It'll move one time and then they'll leave it alone because they tapped on the front door 10 times and nothing happened. So they might think I'm going to tap this painting 10 times. Nothing will happen. Some people will think, okay, what if I keep trying here? Shouldn't they, shouldn't a painting at some point do something because it's different than a front door? And then some people will never at all even think of interacting with the painting. This is again, the, an Easter egg. It's not required to complete the game. You could make it to be required, of course. You can do whatever you want in a game. But as you kind of build up the um, pieces of your game, you can decide what you like. Let's see what will happen here. More of this control of the of the animation. Tap it another a number of times before we reach the limit. It's going to sway. When we reach the limit, I want more animation of it now falling down. So I want to break out of the loop area here. This loop area here matters until we get to the limit. Then when we get to the limit, jump to the next part of the uh, animation. So after my main swaying over here, I'm gonna then start to animate it so that it falls down. amount, and then falls over, breaks, whatever I want to do. A little bounce as well. All right, so then it's going to loop to that. I haven't finished with the code yet, but what's going to happen is after we reach the limit, then break out of the loop into these next frames, where then it animates and falls. Obviously, when it then hits the ground, stop, or else it'll loop back to one. So obviously, at the end of my animation here, stop. So the code will be that, in my case, it's frame 13. Once we reach the limit, true, go to and play. In my case, frame 13, it's going to play. It's going to break out of the loop. It's going to jump right away from frame 2 to frame 13, play my animation of it falling, and then um, get to frame, in my case, frame 19, 20. Uh, it's going to animate and then get to frame 20 and stop at that point. So this is no, the fancy term is control flow. Normally, the code runs from uh, wherever the playhead hits from left to right. It's going to then trigger the code from top to bottom by default. Then it's going to loop over. Control flow, we're, we're, we're controlling the flow of the code by having these go-tos and plays, go-tos and stops. We saw go-to and play, go-to and stop when we move to a completely different scene. Remember that one, however, needed a frame number and then a scene. I want to keep it within this timeline so I don't have to specify a scene name, but I'm saying within this timeline that we're at, oops, I deleted my first one over here, um, but within the... Um, Within the within the timeline of this element, 
go to and play us or go to and stop us. See. So again, as you're playing your own game, yeah, you're going to have to go through your own game unless you program shortcuts and so forth, which I'm not going to get to at the moment. But let's see here. So actually, I want the painting a little bit higher. When I moved it, I moved it out of the way. Just a moment. This doesn't matter. But for the aesthetics, I need that to be at a certain height. There, there we go. Um, you move things inside of a symbol and then moves it out of the main timeline. So anyway, yeah, so you have to play your own game uh, and especially the things that are gonna be random when we get to later, unless you program shortcuts for the for the developer, you can have to go through your own game. Anyway, tap it once. Okay, it's gonna loop around until it get to some limit, reach the limit, false. You need to be lower. And then um, if I tap it, it's gonna start over, which again, doesn't make sense. So what we need to do at that point, of course, is remove the interactivity. So a little bit of polish here. I need to lower it further down. I need to stop the event to listener. And then of course, add a key behind it and then add it to the inventory. So we'll get to the first break in a moment. I just wanna put the polish here and we'll take a break. I wanna move it lower to the right spot. So it falls in the right place. You reach the limit as the um, trace says. Obviously, if I tap it again, it starts over. Doesn't make sense. I have to turn off the listener. Turning off the listener is the same way as we did it with the tree. So why not go back to the tree, review that code, and then adapt it to the new. The tree happened at the front door. And the tree, okay, in the symbol of the tree is where we had remove listener in the symbol. Good thing I made myself that note there. So note, remove listener is inside that symbol. Okay, so inside the tree symbol, front tree. Movie clip this root, remove listener. Movie clip this root, turn off the animation. Okay, so copy that from inside of the tree, the remove listener, paste it into the painting after it animates down to the floor. Of course, change the change the instance name. F and painting animate, I think. Painting animate, yes. And we can just note that as before. Just like the tree, we, we remove listener to the painting, 
so it doesn't interact anymore. So again, if we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight parts of the code that didn't change and only one and two that did, well, I just did a shortcut, advanced hacker technique, copy and paste, and make a change. This is what a lot about programming is, game programming, pieces of code, ingredients, what is necessary. What was necessary is what's the thing I no longer want to be listening, and what is the thing I'm no longer going to run once I stop listening. Those are the two things that changed. Everything else here on the main timeline, there's a thing, stop listening to it via taps on the main timeline, stop paying attention to that animation function. If that works, then after I break the painting, after I knock over the painting, it will no longer be interactive. We'll take a break. And then after the break, let's add the key behind the painting and then inventory tracker, simple one. So tap the painting a few times, make that more or less just to speed up development, maybe make it two or one just to do it instead of tapping 10 times, falls over, I should tap it and nothing happens. Perfect, nothing happens. So our code is in several parts of the, of the uh, project, but as usual, I'll put my example code on Canvas and the recording. Let's stop with our first break here. Questions, comments in general? Does the logic kind of make sense? Should I jump to a specific screen before we go to the break? Any questions or comments at this point? So we spent this hour to make a, a painting fall down. <laughs> and that is just to point out that programming, game programming is maybe not difficult, but time consuming. If you're a beginner, yes, this is the hardest thing you've ever done. Honestly, the pro when I do programming in any of my classes, it's the hardest thing that I teach. Hopefully, I, I explain it good enough. Hopefully, by me repeating the same thing in three different ways, hopefully it makes sense. I could obviously teach this much faster, but I personally like to teach it very slowly, especially for beginners. If you're a bit more advanced, it might sometimes feel a little slow, but I think as a beginner, it's valuable to go slow, to repeat myself several times, and then it will make sense. Let's take a break. It's 1.15. We'll take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 1.25. Going.
Yo, here's those first few lines. The only thing he added at the bottom was the line 21 here. Yeah, so it starts at line eight. Need to copy any of the comment, just the important code right there. The comment is just for information. Important code is there.
continue here. So at this point, the whole point of what we've been doing here is we're going to discover something behind the painting. What's behind the painting will be a key or a treasure map or um, anything we want. And so here we're going to introduce this concept of uh, the inventory, inventory system. Sounds inventory very complex. System. What's that? Inventory system. Inventory system, yes. So that sounds very complex, but the idea is still simple in terms of a variable or several variables to keep track of things. So there's several ways to do this, of course, just like with any coding. And we've looked, we've seen variables three times so far. We saw our first variable at the front door where we have a variable keeping track of um, the boundaries where we can move the rock, where we said anywhere on screen. You can make a variable that is limited to a certain place. We have a variable in the hallway painting that is keeping track of how many times it moves. Uh, items and keys and weapons and gems and all of that, that's also going to be related to variables. And so similar to numbers to keep track of things, we can keep track of them uh, very simply in terms of true and false. Do you have the key to open this door, true or false? True, I have it, therefore the key opens. False, I don't have it, therefore the key doesn't open. So we have those two very simple concepts of computer programming, two, true or false, which are technically known as a Boolean term. I'll write it in a moment. But a Boolean means true or false. True or false. So to reveal the key, to pick up the key, then we're going to have some variable true. We have the key. Well, before that, our variable existed and it was set to false. When the game starts, do we have the tree? Uh, do we have the key? False. Once we pick up the key, do we have the key? True. And then that'll help us do other things. So far, we've been writing code in a particular scene to accomplish what we need in that scene. And that's worked fine. Within the title scene, I've got the code related to what we do in the title. Within the front door, we've got code related to that scene. We can, same thing in the hallway, we can write code here regard, related to this screen here. But now we're thinking in terms of, we need this key for two scenes later. Or what if I get to that scene, I never got the key, and I want to backtrack. So we have to think that code also works throughout the whole app, the whole game, not just on the one scene. Most of the time, perhaps, you're going to write code specifically for a scene, but sometimes you need code that applies throughout the whole game in all scenes. So I'm going to make a note here. In the, uh, in the hallway, I'm going to make a note for myself that back on title scene, some of that code is going to exist that I need it for this scene and future scenes. We'll say here as a comment, this is on the hall. Um, we will say um, we'll pick up a key here and keep track of it via a variable we created at the start of the game, which is scene title, and using Boolean, the Boolean values, which is just true or false, So what I'm saying here is we're going to create a variable 
keeping track of our key in the title scene, and it's going to be true or false. We have the key or not. Obviously, when the game starts, the, the value is false. When we pick up the key here, it will become true. It's in our inventory. It's in memory. We're keeping track of it. And then later on, further within the game, when we try to open the door, our code will check, do you have the key? If we don't have the key, false, the door doesn't open. If we do have the key true, the door does open. We're back on title. Our title. At the end of the code, we can say um, set up inventory system variables. Technically, I would personally like to put this at the top of the code, but in, it doesn't quite matter. I'm going to put it at the end of the code just because logically we have all of this code we've written so far. I kind of want to keep the concept of it together so far. Um, as long as I'm putting this these variables on the first scene is what matters. But if I knew I was going to start from zero, I would probably put these variables near the top. Uh, just to kind of group them in a section, like all the basic important code and then the future code. But as long as it's in this first scene, we'll be okay. And I'm thinking, should we do it in the way we've learned so far or add a new thing? I will do it the way we've done it so far, just so that we understand that. And then I'll maybe change it later. So the way we've done it so far, we do we write VAR to create a variable. And then we can call this, let's say, inv for inventory. There's an inventory item of a key. Well, I might have seven keys. I might have the skull key, the red key. Well, this is the skull key, let's say. This is how I would call these things. There's an inventory item. It is a key, and it is the skull key, let's say. This has a data type, which is this colon. Previously, we've seen rectangle. The type of data that this variable holds are coordinates for a rectangle. And then just a moment ago, we saw colon number. The type of data that this variable holds is a number between negative infinity to positive infinity. Well, here I want a Boolean, which is only true or false. We could do this with numbers. Do I have the three keys to open the door? We can do that, of course. I just want, do I have this one key, yes or no? And at the beginning, this is false. When the game starts, no, I don't have the skull key yet. Oh, I don't have the uh, flame key yet. No, I don't have the uh, inventory item of my armor of uh, diamond. I don't know. Just I'm throwing things in here, the inventory items that I might set up at some point. I'm not actually going to create a flame key or a diamond armor, probably not. But here, this is my inventory system. I have the item or not. What about upgrading it so that it's got level seven diamond? Of course, all of that can be done, but not just yet. And notice all of these are set to false. I don't have these items at the start of the game. When the game loads up, the very first scene, scene title, scene one, all of this code loads into memory. And in memory, we don't have those inventory items yet. Well, of course, later, once we pick up the key, inventory key skull equal true later in the game. And then later in the game after that, when we try to open the door, if inventory key item is equal to true, open the door. Or else it's false. Don't open the door. Spikes come out. So I've got the, some inventory items, and they're all, again, this sort of syntax. Create a variable, create a memory location, call it something. Most likely colon boolean, just true or false. And set it equal to, this is not comparing. If we have written double equals, that's comparing, which is wrong in this case. It's assignment. Take the thing on the right, assign it to the thing on the left. Put this, put this into this and keep track of it for the rest of the game. Because I set this up on the first scene, we're gonna keep track of it for the rest of the game. 
if we created a variable in the help screen and a person never goes to the help screen, this code will never run. If I had set up some inventory item or whatever, some variable, whatever in my help screen, and the person never goes to the help screen, that code will never trigger. So something to keep, keep in mind. But because we set up our inventory on the very first scene, we set up our inventory tracker. So in the way, May the painting fall down. Behind the painting will be a key. Okay, I need to draw a key, turn it into a symbol, give it an instance name. When the key is tapped, that variable will become true. The key on the screen will then go into my inventory, however I want to set it up, that it's in a corner, that it's in a heads-up display, etc. But before that, okay, I need to draw a key. So in my interactive layer, I'm gonna draw a key. Let's see, a key, skull key. Um, let's see, skull key, so. Like a squid. But then we've got the part of the key. So it looks key-ish enough, I guess. That's why I draw one line at a time instead of the whole lines. And then you, when you undo, you, you miss everything. It's a key there. There we go. That's key-ish. Of course, everything that has a color filled in is what's clickable. I'm drawing it out of the way. I'm going to put it behind the painting, of course but I'm just drawing it out of the way so that I don't draw on top of something. Obviously, I'll put it behind in a moment, but I'm drawing it, resizing it, rotating it, whatever. Needs to be a symbol. So after I draw it, F8 or right click, convert to symbol. This is gonna be a sprite that is rotating from the center calling it skull. Again, we'll put it behind the painting in a moment. And if you try to put it right now, it's in front. Yes, we can change the order of things. We'll do that in a moment. I want to set this up just so that this key is clickable and interactive. Then I'll hide it where it needs to be hidden. Um, but logically, I want to make this key work, and then I'll put it behind the painting, which falls down when since once you interact with it. But this new symbol needs an instance name. an instance name, so I'll call this Key Skull. So that, that's been turned into a symbol. It has the instance name Key Skull in the library. It's SP, it's a sprite, it's a, it's a graphical element. Sprite Key Skull on the, on the scene, it has uh, that name. It needs an event listener. So that a function runs, that's familiar. We've done that several times. I've got my example code that I will copy and paste back from the title. Or if I've memorized it by now, I will just copy and type it from memory. So I'm in the, the hallway. 
object. So, of course, don't forget to add that as the instance name. That is not the name of it in the library. That is easy to lose track of. Some function will run. I like to prefix with fn. It's a function. And um, call this fn key get. Get key, key get. The definition of key get is right here. Fuller definition is here. Break this apart. As usual, write this stuff to remind yourself. Give yourself that trace just to confirm that code is running. Test this just to confirm, again, the failure points. I wrote the code correct, but I forgot the instance name. I wrote the code correct, but the capitals were different. So even up there yet, at least I want to check if that code works. See, I put it outside of the way of the painting just so that I can check if that works. I'll put it behind the painting in a moment. So if I tap that key, key is running, get key is running. Good. Right. So what has to happen here is we need to change the two possibilities. Key in my inventory is false or true. When the game starts, it's false. Now it must be set to true. So it's similar to what we had back on the title, slightly different. Inside of the function that I'm interacting with the key, it's going to be inventory key of skull equal to true. Now this looks different than what's on the um, scene one. Just to make myself a note here, created the key in, in title. And now picked up key. I am creating a variable, VAR, called something. And it's either true or false, Boolean. At the beginning of the game, obviously it's false. I haven't picked up the key yet. It doesn't exist in my inventory. But now that I've tapped on the key, set it equal to true. Again, that's a single equal that is assignment. Double equal is comparison. Most of the time you will do single equal. Most of the time you will set a value. When you compare a value, it's the double equals. And notice I don't need the colon boolean, and I definitely don't need the var. Var is create a variable called this. I'm not creating it. I'm just using it. I created the variable at the start of the game. Now I'm using it here. Well, it might be nice to give myself a console message and or a uh, trace message, and I should have done that at the beginning as well. We won't know unless we tell ourselves, did that work to create the variable? Well, fix that in a moment. We'll say here, um, got the skull key, question, comment, inventory key skull. So in the console, in the output panel, it's going to say, did we get the key? True. Just like the variable holding the counter Whenever we reference that variable, we'll say the number. When we reference this variable, it'll say true or false. This variable holds, can only hold either true or false. The variable of the counter, we set it as colon number. It can only hold numbers, one or 12 or 90 or negative 60 or 3.14. This one can only hold true or false.
if I click on the key, key is running, got the skull key, true. Obviously, if I press it again, it'll keep saying true, of course. But when I tap it, we've set it to true. Well, comparing would be if we didn't have true, we had false. Um, to be most complete, I should go back to back to the title where I created these things, and I should then check on the trace. Um, have the skull key? Do you have the skull key? Tell me what's in the variable skull key. When the game starts for ourselves in the console, our inventory tracker is saying, we don't have the skull key yet. The game just started. The game is ready. We have we don't have that inventory item yet. Do you have the skull key yet? Nope. Okay, as I play the game, that should then change some point into true because true, we got the key. Got the key? True. Game started, got the key, false. When I pick up the key, true. Again, an inventory system can look very complex. Behind the scenes, it's true or false. Do you have that key at a certain point? Do you have the armor at a certain point? Do you have a threshold of experience points? The logic of it is, is, uh, is true or false. Okay, so um, he, picking it up and putting it into the inventory system. Okay, do I want a whole separate screen that comes into view when I select my inventory button? Do I want a row at the bottom of my screen with empty spaces for the keys. And then when I get the key, it fills in so many possibilities for an inventory tracker, right? Uh, it's not about the, um, uh, it's not about the, uh, you're not limited, that is, uh, to your ideas. So I think when eventually we'll polish this to look really nice, but for the moment, we'll put this as a, as a to-do item. We'll say to-do. Set up an inventory screen to show all keys or items or whatever. That's later to do. Temporarily. Temporarily just remove it from on screen. Get it out of the way so that it is no longer uh, clickable. You you clicked it, you picked it up. It's in your inventory. Later, we'll make it appear on screen in the corner or in our magic bag or whatever. Later, for the moment, just remove it. Well, this uh, key skull, instance name, dot, I have that in my notes here, but I believe it's just remove child. Just confirm that. Leave the code is simply, that's funny, remove child. Okay, it's not that expected one. Do we remove child with the instance name? We do remove child again. I thought it was just the, like that. Okay, when you don't have it in your notes, you just do this. Uh, AS3, remove child. AS3 is the code we're using, action script three. I have to do a quick reminder to myself. Uh, how do we do remove child again? Adobe manual, refresh my memory, remove child, blah, blah, blah. I'll target display object.
is, is the code, but do we reference its own instance name again? Okay, let's see that. So the instance name of this is that. So that, I, does it attach to a thing? So this is a thing. Even though I've been teaching this class for years and the, um, I know what it is. It's this root, movie clip, movie clip, this root. From the main timeline, remove something. What are we removing? That that skull, key skull. Should be it. Yeah, no error, but let me just confirm. So anyway, I'm saying, even though me, that I'm teaching the class and I've taught it for years, I don't have every code memorized. I don't, I don't need to have every code memorized. You saw how I just looked it all up. Uh, you know, Google it and I found it. Okay, so I'm out here. If I tap it, there we go. It goes away. I got the key. True. So obviously I want to then program it so that it goes into my inventory or that appears down on the heads up display or whatever later. At the very least, I don't want to keep clicking on it and keep getting the key. That wouldn't make sense. But here's a way to interact with things on screen that they go away. Here's another one of these um, ingredients. How to remove an instance from the timeline. I no longer want that thing on screen like I knocked the boulder over. Okay, on the main timeline, we've seen that before. On the main timeline, command remove child. What child? What instance? The instance name of the thing. So this is sort of main timeline. Say it like this to be obvious. That means main timeline. Remove child dot remove child with that spelling. A visual element object with an instance name. side of the parentheses, instance name, object to remove. Probably turn off the event listener. Technically, it's still floating around in memory if I don't remove the event listener, although now there's nothing to click on. Uh, we'll do that as a to-do item at some point. To-do. Also remove the event listener. So to have the most efficient code when you no longer need something, some code, for example, remove it, turn it off. Technically, even though I've removed the thing to click on, it animator is still going to be paying attention to listen for a tap on this thing. This thing isn't on the screen, but it's still going to pay attention to it. It's still going to use some amount of RAM a tiny amount, but if I had this on, you know, 50 things on screen, all of those little things add up. Later, we can remove the listener, and we've seen how to remove listeners. You can do it on your own if you want. I have my own note here to do it later. But now, because inside of the function here of after tapping, I've set my inventory to true throughout the rest of the game, my inventory item is set to true. So other, in other parts of the game, I can then deal with that info. I can deal with, I can use that memory, that little piece of memory there to polish it all up here. Okay, I want this behind the painting. So, okay, if I put that behind the painting, well, there's two ways to do this, of course. If I put it in separate layers, I put the key onto its own layer. Obviously, then the key layer is below the painting layer. Of course, I can that, paste it into its own layer, and then, of course, put the layers in the right order. And of course, I can put it in the right order in separate layers. Or if I don't want to make a ton of layers, here's another way to do it. 
put that object on top of that object and it doesn't go behind it, either the object below or above, you can click it and then you can right click it. And here we have a range. We have this area here. We have the obvious layers in the timeline. And then we have these sort of like hidden layers or some other way to describe it that within a layer, I can order things on top of each other in the layer. I don't have to have separate layers. Within the layer, I can bring to front, bring forward, send backward, send to back. So the key right now, I want it behind the painting within the same layer. Right click, arrange, send backward or send to back. Let's say I've got three things. One, middle, top. The top one, if I send to back, it'll go under that one. There's still one below it. But if I set, send two back, that one will go all the way to the bottom below the third one there. So backward is, is lowering at one level, send two back is all the way down, and bring to forward is move it ahead of one thing, or just put it on the very top of everything. In my case, it's very simple. I've got two things, so either of these will work. Usually I want send to back. So they're in the same layer. We're still in the same interact layer. And now I've got an object above it. This is that we order our elements. As usual, many ways to do the same thing. Maybe the easy way, just put it on separate layers. Uh, one mistake that you could make from doing it the way that I did it of just arranging is you're going to forget you've got things in the same layer because again there's no way to know what's above or below unless you move the painting out of the way and you see it yourself it might be better as a beginner for, for less to keep track of uh, if you put it on separate layers but if I know that in this scene, I know the whole point that I made the move the painting is because I know I've got a key there. If I remember that, then I'll just do it this way. But okay, move it over a little bit. And what might be interesting though is also when it moves over, what about if I had, what about if I put the key in a little, a little bit to the left so that when it moves over, I see a little corner of it. Right now I put it exactly behind the painting so you don't see it at all. And some player might say, okay, tap it twice, nothing happens, moving on. And they don't try the third time, and then finally it falls and they see it. What if I um, give a little hint and that I moved the, um, the key a little bit to the left? Now the part here is have to juggle these layers around. So uh, I have to select the painting, arrange it to the back so that I can see the key, then move the key somewhat to the left over here somewhere. Then again, grab the key, right click, and then arrange it to the back again. And that is that if a person pays attention and now they move the painting, hey, what did I see behind the painting? They try to tap it again and then they eventually get the key. All of these little gameplay things to keep track of and to and to consider. So I'm on the hallway. I move it over. Oh, I saw something for a moment. What is that? And then, oops, fell over. Key is revealed. Pick up the key. It's in the inventory. True. Key is no longer clickable, of course. It doesn't exist on screen. Painting is no longer clickable. Obviously, what I'm doing here is I'm drawing all my interactive elements in a very obviously red and blue colors. Uh, as we go through these various weeks, we're creating the, the, the basic um, 
ugly versions of things. But then once the main code is working, and I would really recommend everyone be focused on your code rather than your visuals. Once your code is working, then you can go back to the visuals and really make them nice. Because most of these interactive elements, they're going to be, or all these interactive elements are going to be a symbol that you can go in and, you know, go in and tweak that tree perfectly as much as you want. But I really would recommend as we progress in the class, make sure your code works. Don't worry about the visuals yet. It's stick figures until we get the code working. Obviously, later, once we pick up the key, we want it to play a sound. When we pick up the key, we want it to go on the inventory heads-up display. Or in the side screen, I swipe from the left, and my panel opens up on the left, and all my inventory is there, of course, later. But for the moment... But if I animated the key before it disappears, I can skull key dot play to play a timeline of the animation of it spinning and flashing and then disappearing. But you do that if you want. But we've learned so far what we need to do for that. Play a timeline of a movie clip. On here, okay, move to the left, move to the right. That'll be very simple. Two squares to click on to move to some new screens. Those new screens don't exist yet. And then the code to make those move, to move us from scene to scene, very easy. We've done that before. Um, I want to create the screens of the left path and the right path, and then the code for, for um, clicking those to move there. So I need to make two new scenes. For uh, left and right paths. And as usual, I need a layer for my non-interactive stuff, my interactive stuff and my code. Uh, a little shortcut here, I'll show you in a moment, right? Because you can duplicate scenes. Now I don't want to duplicate one of these scenes that already exists, uh, that is very complex. In my case, my end, good end and bad end are candidates that I can re I use for, I can reuse for a duplicate because I've got a layer for my background and a layer for my actions and a stop command. I have in my case, I haven't done anything on those screens visually. But on the new screens I'm about to create, I want a background, a code layer, and a stop. In my case, my scene of end good fits the bill, so I will duplicate it and rename it to scene right hall one. You have, you know, 50 halls there, whatever. But there's a scene on the right path of a hallway one. And then duplicate the good scene again. In my case, call that scene left path hall one. And the order of these scenes doesn't matter, but in, I personally want to keep my endings at the very end, because it's the end of the game. And then these various paths here, left, right, doesn't matter the order of these. We'll probably program the right one first and then the left one, but doesn't matter because we're going to jump around. But I need now a hall to the right, a hall to the left. Pop me there. We also want to trace you are on the right path, on the right word path, on the right word path hallway. This is on the left. We're on the left word path hallway or whatever message I want to say. The right hallway. It's gonna be a door at the end of the hallway.
door will be an interactive element uh, in a moment. This is also where we're going to get the mini boss, but uh, we'll do that soon enough. Right now, I'm just creating the a hallway. Maybe over here, we'll also have a side door or another path, door over here or whatever. Um, very simple here. I just want to uh, have... something about um, the perspective here. I'll polish it later, so um, left hallway, something very similar, just flipped in the other direction, maybe with a different, slightly different design. This one's going to have arched doorway. Oh. What I'm saying you shouldn't do to stress too much the details. You can do that later, but it's fun. Anyway, so we got a left side, left hallway. We've got a right hallway. Right hallway. Non-interactive elements. There's going to be a door a little later that'll be interactive. There's going to be a mini boss that appears here that you have to defeat. On the uh, left hallway, uh, eventually what's going to happen here is, okay, there's going to be a door. Uh, that needs uh, a time limit before the before the spikes come down and get you. So that later. Well, we can't get to these screens until we progress from the main hall. That's the easy part. This is clickable to go to that scene. This is clickable to go to the other scene. We've done that before. You can copy and paste some code from elsewhere. It's the same sort of thing like back on the title. When I want to go to the help screen, tap it to go to the help screen. To go to the help screen, main timeline, go somewhere. So hit copy and paste, uh, game start code. That's 99% what I want. So I'll just copy that back from the title, we'll put it into the hallway. Change, of course, what's the thing I'm clicking on? What's the result of clicking on it? That's the results right there. Um, Somewhere. The same thing for the left hallway. I should save it and end the class at this point, and then you 
fill in the things that should be filled in. That should be obvious what you need to do here, of course. What's the instance name? What's the code to run? The definition of the code? Where do I go? Obviously, during these lectures, I show the code, explain the code, run the code. But you're not always going to be in a classroom. You're not always going to have someone that's going to give you the answer. Definitely, once you start to get more ideas for your game, you need to add to the game as you wish. And usually, you'll be able to do it based on what we've learned. All of these ingredients you're getting, you just go back and review your code. Yeah, it's 500 lines of code. but you know, there's like seven commands we're going to do, not 700 commands. It's going to be 700 lines of code, but it's like seven commands. We do the same things over and over in a variety of ways. So to make this make sense, this right symbol has an instance name, right hallway. Or what I'm clicking on is that. The left word symbol has its own instance name. So then that there, after trying to go to the right, well, that'll be some function. Trying to go to the left, that'll be some function. Um, this is up to you to call this what you want. I could call this kitty, you can call this birdie. These things will be called whatever you want. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. What? How am I interacting with a cat? So you call these however you want. But uh, logically for me, let's see. Function, move right. Well, we're going to move right in various ways of the game. And you, when you call your code, when you put your name, if I, if I call this, you know, move right, and I try to use move right elsewhere in the app, I've already said move right moves me to the hallway of the right. But if you try to move right when you're near the dragon, there is no right there and it goes wrong. What I'm saying is this unique code right here is unique throughout the whole app. That's why we created the inventory key on the first scene. And then we set it to true three scenes later, and then we will use it four scenes later. All of this code is running throughout the memory the first time that it loads. And therefore, when you name these codes yourself, you don't want them to conflict. You want them to have unique function names as necessary. So function, all main mo go right. This one here, function in the hallway of the main hallway, go somewhere to the left. I could have these names like uh, and path two. If that makes sense to you, that you name them that way, great. I personally usually type the names very detailed with lots of detail because you can just copy and paste. You don't have to remember what you type, just copy and paste it. And it's good to give detail because your code itself can give you detail. So something about going to the right hallway, to the left hallway. This is a key, my skull key versus the flame key versus the ice key. That's up to us to define those right on the next line. With our little trace messages to make sure it's all working with our end note to lose not lose track of the curly braces. Same thing up here, copy that. And remember the shortcuts, if you double click your code, it'll select a chunk of code. If you triple click, select the whole line. If I double click that, then copy, double click that, paste, click that, paste, click that, paste. Here we go. Well, here's the names of our scenes. Scene right, scene left.
of ones that one looks almost like an l be careful about that that's not hall la 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 it's hall one hall one i guess it'd be easier to read if i had called them zero one because i might have hall 12 call it zero one there i need to make sure that i called it zero one within the names up here it's one just make sure that you know that's a one not an not three l's it's a one it's a one Funny that it's only like three pixels that are different between the L and the one. The vertical line and the horizontal line, exactly the same, but that little angle, it's just three pixels or two pixels that are different. So this is nothing new. Click on something to move us somewhere. Instead of using one and two, maybe AB. Yeah, that could be done that way too. Whatever way helps you remember it all. Keep track of it. All right, let's see if that works. So, um, open the front door, it animates, pick up the rock, break in, just to make sure painting still works. Oops, painting still works, grab the key. Go right, at the right, dead end, nothing to interact with here so far. The debug it again. unless I program it to be able to move back and forward. We'll do back and forward in a moment, maybe next time or in a moment. Right now we're going very straightforward linear movement. Obviously, if we wanna go back, we can program that in easily. But we have to program it in, it's not built in. Just testing to make sure those work at least before going too far. Go to the left, and to the left. My uh, output down here tells me that I've been interacting with it. This is all optional, of course, but this feedback is good because the computer won't give you feedback when you do it right, but it'll definitely tell you when you do it wrong. I'm at the leftward path. Now, these are very obvious elements to click on. We want the player to be unable to break the window if the broken tree is in the front door. How do we disable that action? Let me read that again. If we want the player to be unable to break the window if the broken tree is in front of the window, that would that would work. That would have to be set up with a little bit of Boolean true or false. On very first scene, is tree broken equals false. And then once we break the tree within the code of the animation of it breaking, we would have is tree broken equals true. Once that is true, then you further have to code that when you tap on the window, is tree broken equal to true, then it'll stop letting you get in front of the window or else the tree is not broken, false. So then you can get into the window. So it's combining what we did with true, false, and also if else. So it's not a short answer. It's an answer. Of course, we can do it. Anything we want to do, we can do it. But the logic of doing it is you're going to have to set up on scene one a way to keep track true or false. Is that tree broken? And then when you interact with the, then when you interact with the, uh, either the, either the rock or the window, we're going to check if, tree broken equal to true, then remove listener to the rock or not play the broken window animation. So yeah, there you go. So yep, yeah, 
that now we'll have a true false to keep track of. And then once we touch the rock to the window, it will first check uh, falseness, most likely in the window. No, it'll happen also within the timeline of right here. Um, touch those two. If the tree is broken, do not do the play. If it is not broken tree, then true play the window. Right, so in uh, the final thing for the day is, okay, uh, these are very obvious interactive elements. And if I play a game for real, I don't want big red blocks to show me where I can click. I could if I want to, it's up to you. But I want to make those invisible. Very, very easy because they are symbols. I left them visible until I know the code works. Once I know the code works, I'll turn them invisible because I might forget that there's things there and then I have to hunt for my own objects. But once something is a symbol, all you have to do then is go to color effect in the properties, set alpha to zero. There's still an object there, it's just invisible. It's still interactive, it still has an instance name, it's still clickable, but now alpha visibility is zero. Now that whole area is still clickable, it's just an invisible click. See, that looks normal. Click on that hallway somewhere, anywhere, like right here, moves to the right. For this particular case, it's very obvious. Anywhere that you click there is clickable, alpha of zero, to remind you that we did that trick uh, for the left one, I'm going to set its alpha very low, not completely invisible, but just very, very low to remind myself. Okay, there's, I did a, I did this, I made this work by having a symbol that had alpha invisible. I'm going to put it very, 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 very light, just to remind us. When the game is finished, I probably want to put it on zero. And uh, that's how we can make an area clickable having an obvious thing to click on. Just make a shape, alpha it to zero, one, and it does the job. Right, we see it, left hallway. Let you think of something here. If I want to go back, I don't like this path anymore to create some area clickable here to go back, maybe on the right edge here, maybe on the bottom edge here, maybe on the bottom and the right edge, maybe element that is clickable here, turn it into a symbol, give it an instance name, and then add your code to, to create movement. So I won't do it, maybe you want to. How do I go back if I went the wrong way? you need to create an, a clickable element to go back, to go back to scene hall main. We'll do it together next time, but we're at the end of the day today. And so here's our game so far. I think it's coming together pretty well. We added this brand new cool thing about interact with an environment to then work with something else in the environment. We added the inventory system. It's true or false. Do we have this thing or not? We can get complex with the true or false. Good question about what about if this thing is broken, does that affect that thing with some true or false? We're gonna, when we come back next time, when we go to the right hallway, well, here we're gonna have a doorway at the end of the end of the hallway. But before we can get to the end of the ha hallway, there'll be a boss here, which we need to attack and lower its hits, hit points. And we when we defeat the boss, then we can get to the door. I can't get to the door until I defeat the boss. So we'll make a boss and it'll it'll be coming at us. Time limit before it gets to us. If it gets to us, we'll get to the first instance of bad ending. We have our first 
example of where we can lose the game because the boss is, the mini boss is coming at us. We're, if we run out of time, bad ending. If we defeat it within the time, we can go to the next scene. See how it goes? And then we'll also work on the left hallway. On this one, it's going to be about uh, the uh, some random stuff will happen on screen. And then there'll also be a time limit. And if you don't do the thing within the random time, I mean, with if you don't if you don't work with the random thing within the time, there'll be spikes that get you. If you do do it within the time, you move to the next screen. So you see, there's no death scenes yet. We're still doing the sort of training mode of the game, you know, being able to click and go forward and backward, go to the help, go to the go to the storyline. We have a basic interaction. Just go forward. We then have interaction of multiple things on screen, dead ends, and then hit states, uh, hit detection. Then we have interacting with one thing to interact with another thing, but no deaths yet. Obviously, you know, we could have, oh, I tried to climb the tree and it fell on my neck, game over. But no, I didn't put any death or, or win screens yet, not until the fourth or fifth screen mini boss. And as I said, I also want to add, I've got it in the to-do list. Right now, we know how the game works, or I'm telling you how the game's working. When a person plays for the first time, it's going to be a lot of hunt and peck, and a lot of guessing and dying and retrying. Sure. But what I want to do, once the main stuff is done, I want to implement this item here about a uh, 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 character cutscene. I want your character to appear first, maybe give some hints about what to do on that screen or what to avoid on that screen, and then letting the player interact. That'll give you a chance to show off your character, the drawings of your characters, and put out plots and give hints and such. Uh, of course, we'll do we probably will do character select eventually. We'll see about that movement. We did inventory and how it matters more, more to come. Their name in there so that their name appears on screen and such. If you have any other ideas as well that you would like, depending on the complexity, we could also add it to the project. So we'll end at this point. I'll upload my example code, all of this that works so far for me, as you've seen. I'll upload this to Canvas so you can compare your code and my code. This recording will be added to Canvas also. We'll be back on Wednesday. I'll reiterate what the homework is on Wednesday. You can look at what it is today if you want, but I'll tell you the homework on Wednesday. And uh, this is week five, day one.